Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to day two of theCUBE's live coverage of Falcon 2024 here in Las Vegas. The room is buzzing around me. The keynote speakers have just left the stage. I'm Rebecca Knight, alongside my co-host, co-analyst, co-founder of theCUBE. Just Dave, call me Nemesis just, Kitten. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know, we, we all should have. If you, if you were a virus, what would your virus <laughs> right. name be? That's, a, that's, that's funny. I'd like to welcome, first time ever on theCUBE, John Sapp. He is the CISO at Texas Mutual Insurance. Thank you so much. Direct from Austin, Texas. Yeah, Coming thank you so much. I'm glad to be here and excited about the opportunity to talk with you today. Awesome. John, why don't you start by telling our viewers a little bit about, about Texas Mutual and, and about your role, your day-to-day -day role. Absolutely, so I'm the VP of Information Security and CISO at Texas Mutual Insurance Company. As you said, based in Austin, Texas. We are a workers' compensation only insurance company, so that's the only line of business we have. Although we did um, recently launch a uh, health insurance uh, line that will sell policies coming up real soon. But we focus on helping injured workers get back to work. And so we, we have a motto of being a stable force for good in Texas. And so we really care about our policyholders and our injured workers. And in your role as a CISO, in terms of the, the, the sensitive information that you're guarding over. Yeah, so in, in that regard, so I'm responsible for protecting our stakeholders' data. That is whether you're a policyholder, an agent, an injured worker, an employee. Uh, and so it is really about protecting our systems and our data from the adversaries that seek to gain from, from accessing it. And those adversaries are increasingly capable. We know this, they're very clever. Um, and the, the concept of risk is one that's const constantly evolving. Uh, I, I tend to think of it as, okay, what's the probability of some kind of event and what's the impact of that? And your job right. is to reduce the impact. You really can't affect, well, I, I, I guess you can affect in a way the probability. I wonder how you think about risk, the changing nature of risk, how it's evolved and how you're approaching the problem. Yeah, and I like you use the word probability because probability is based on data. And we use data to determine when, where, and how an attack is likely to occur and basically the, the means by which the attacker could get into the environment. So being able to identify, mitigate, and manage risk is very important because at the end of the day, we have to understand what our risks are and just from the use of technology, risk is, is it's an inherent thing and it can lead to cascading risks of different types, whether it's operational, financial, or otherwise. So we're hearing so much. The theme of this show is resilient by design. And we're hearing, we're hearing a lot of that. We're talking a lot about it here on theCUBE as well as on the, on the keynote stage and in conversations over lunch. What does that mean to you? And how do you think about this great, scary, interconnected world that we live in where, as Dave said, our adversaries are just becoming more powerful? Right, so I, I love, first of all, I love the theme, resilient by design. It's, it's kind of a takeoff, secure by design privacy by design, all those other things that we've, we've, we've dealt with over the years. And the time is now to become resilient by design. And resiliency is not redundancy, and I think sometimes people confuse the two. Resiliency is about your ability to respond and recover. Because it's not if, but when something is going to occur, whether it's you know, um, some type of software defect or whether it is you know, an attack itself, we have to be able to respond and recover. So it's not if, but when. And we have to be able to do that effectively and efficiently. So the probability, you basically just said, is virtually 100%. Absolutely. Right, of some kind of incident. And then there are cyber incidents, which are threats that, you know, the exfiltration of your data or you know, ransomware. But also there's IT risks right. where technology, technology breaks. Remember the flash crash? Oh boy. What happened? <laughs> oh, it was a glitch. A glitch, AKA, we have no idea what happened. Right. We still right. don't know. Right. So, so how do you think about those two dimensions of risk? Yeah, you know, I, I'll tell you, so Y2K taught us something years ago, and that is that, you know, software development is more of an art than it is a science sometimes. And there are things that the human doesn't think about, you know, we, we, we take shortcuts sometimes, and you know, you, back then we, we used two digit years versus four, and that became a problem. But, you know, fast forward to today, and you know, technology is at the center of everything we do in every, in every part of our lives, right? So it is, we depend on it so much, and our world is so interconnected, something is going to happen. You know, we, we use our, our phones, and updates happen, and, and things go wrong, and, and then we find ourselves struggling, right? So it's being able to, 
plan and prepare for those things because they are going to happen. We, we can't predict what they're going to be. We can say typically kind of what types of things they're going to be, but being able to respond and recover from that is key. What, what role do you think public policy plays here? Because we have executive <coughs> orders, we have a lot of finger wagging from the U.S. government about you know, better cyber resilience from, they're talking to you, right? And, and saying, right. oh, you got to do a better job. They're talking to George Kurtz, you got to do a better job. Right. Um, uh, but, but they're not attacking that side of the equation that you just mentioned on the technology side. Do you see that changing? I, I do, and, and that's one of, one of my predictions is that just like the, the, the regulations that went into place last July became effective this year around cybersecurity incidents and reporting and right. all of those things, right? They didn't, they thought, they talked about cybersecurity incidents, but what about technology incidents? Because those can impact, the, the materiality of those types of incidents can also impact a stakeholder, a shareholder. So it is going to become, we can't just isolate on cybersecurity, but we also have to look at technology risk as something that we have to make sure that we're effectively managing. And I like to say, it's time for us to turn GRC around. We've talked about governance risk and compliance for years, right? Now it's time to turn it around to CRG, cyber risk governance, and that is, encompasses both technology and cybersecurity risk. So how, as a leader in an organization, do you try to make sure that you are cultivating this, this culture of resilience, not only within your team who, who gets it and, and truly understands the risks, but also within the greater organization, which may be, I don't want to say oblivious, but it, they, right. they've got other functions that are doing other things in their jobs. Yeah, it, it's a great question. And part of our job as, as a security leader is to both educate and inform the executives and the board. And the way we do that is through a level of reporting that's in a language that they can understand. So one of the things that I do is I quantify risk in financial terms. Because if I can give them at least a range of what the probable losses will be, whether it's a technology incident or a cybersecurity incident, then they have an understanding of what our resiliency planning needs to be from an operational standpoint. Because now we're talking about business continuity management. You know, business continuity is people and processes, disaster recovery is the technology side of things, you put those together, and that's what that topic's all about. But being able to put that in terms that are understood, and you can say, if we're down for four hours, our losses are probably going to be this, but it's all based on data that I collect from our financial statements or from numbers that are provided by the organization itself. They are not numbers that I create out of thin air. I was going to ask you, you're really sticking your neck <laughs> on the line there. Because, you know, 10 to 15 years ago, in cyber, failure meant you got fired. And that's not the case anymore. Right. And it was not a board level topic, it clearly is today. But I always ask these folks, how do you communicate to the board? What you just said is, you basically have a probability of an event which is 100%, you have an impact of that event, which is an expected loss, and right. you, through technology and people and process, can reduce that expected loss, and you're actually putting a number on that for the board based on other data with a little asterisk that says Absolutely. caveat, this is not my data, this is the organizational data, here's my methodology, how I did exactly. it. Exactly. That must be an interesting conversation. They probably really poke holes in your assumptions and you know, and, they, they and, really and do, partner but, with you, but right? I'll, I'll I mean, say this, they, they take the, the approach that they want to learn and understand. Sure because the first question is always, how did you get that number? Right. How did you calculate that? Because humans are the ones who create the data. We can't You're overlook absolutely that. Right. You're absolutely right. And so when you, when you think about it, it is the controls that you have in place, because that's one of the things that we first do as, as CISOs, is we, we have a strategy, we have a plan, we understand what our controls are, what our frameworks are that we're going to use, all those good things, right? But it is helping the organization understand Where's the open window? Where's the open door? And what could occur if we don't close that window or door? And it becomes how I justify the investments or my budget for protecting the organization. Sure, because you're asking for a dollar amount and they're saying, okay, your reduction in expected loss is the, the value that we're going to get out of it. Exactly. Where, where'd that come from? But the outcome is, when I think in terms of ROI, uh, benefit over cost, what you're doing to the adversaries is increasing the denominator so that their cost goes up, Correct. so they go somewhere else because their benefit will go down. 
let's not, let's not attack this company because you know, they're more cyber resilient. Let's go somewhere else where I knock on the door, it's open and we can just walk in. That, you're, you're exactly right and that's the thing is that part of what that education process also is, is helping the board and the executives understand the trends and why we are now looking at, I take a capability mapping and say these are our capabilities today. These are where we, the areas where we're most mature, these are the areas where we need to improve, and now they can understand why I want to spend $5 over here versus $2 over there. Because that, that re reduction in risk and the value associated with that, that's how we calculate the return on investment. If I put my board hat on, the hardest part I think is it's not a static environment, it's constantly changing. That's why you know, the, the threat hunters at places Absolutely. like CrowdStrike and the government and you know, other, other firms, not just CrowdStrike, is, is, is vital for you being able to stay on top of things, which must be extremely difficult. How do you, how do, you do that? Yeah, you know, and it, it, there's one thing that I think rings very true in, in this industry, both technology and cyber, is that we have to not only, we, we have to collaborate and we have to work together both technology and cybersecurity, because the challenge is that the attackers are using technology to carry out their attacks. So they are absolutely interconnected, intertwined, we can't separate them. And so by what we do is we look at things from a more holistic standpoint so that we understand what the, from a risk standpoint, where, where we're most at risk and what is the inherent risk of the way we do business, the use of technology in business, and how do we reduce that to an acceptable level of residual risk? What's your number one challenge as a CISO today? I will say, you know, it is more about human behavior risk. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the people who are, are well-intentioned, the employee, the contractor, whoever it may be, but it's also, you think about it, and there have been insiders placed into organizations. And so it's also thinking about that because understanding human behavior risk in those, those well-intentioned employees, but also if I have an insider, whether it is someone who is planted or found their way in to infiltrate, or whether it was someone who becomes disgruntled and becomes that insider that I have to worry about. So there's a couple dimensions of that. Um, one is bad human behavior beats good security every time. Right. So it's, it's, there's a cultural aspect of that. The other is, the talent you have in your organization and the tools, the, the people, the process and technologies to thwart, to find things like insider threats. So that's a, again. Because, because a lot of those, those employees are unwittingly making yes. their companies vulnerable Absolutely. to attack. It, it's on not, links. Right, right, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you look back at some of the breaches that occurred um, last year, where there were cyber adversaries who basically reached out to people in organizations who were not making necessarily the, the, the greatest wage, and they offer them you know, a lump sum of money. Hey, if you provide me with this access, here, here's your payout. And so, you know, so the, the insider, the employee who was well-intentioned, but you know, who has some financial troubles of their own, all of a sudden now, $25,000, know, that, that becomes a lot of money, and so now they provide access. So that's how the whole, I call it the e-crime the e ecosystem is being fueled and how they're being provided information that access brokers sell on the dark web, and that's, it literally is an entire e-crime ecosystem that, that goes on, and so that's, that's how they're getting information and opening the doors to our organizations. I, I often say any knucklehead can be in ransomware us to go on the dark web, but don't do it, because AI's going to catch you, <laughs> and, and you're going to get in big trouble, <laughs> but it's true. It's true. It's, and ransomware as a service is a thing, and it has it, been it for It really a while. is, and you know, I'll tell you, I educated the board on that uh, two years ago, about ransomware as a service, and they didn't realize that, that it's an entire business, you know, that, that, that rivals our own economy. And so, and it, and it continues to grow. You know, you, you look at some of, some of the surveys out there, I think it's estimated to be about $10.5 trillion business by 2026. Right, so you got ransomware, you're, you're, you're defending against that. You also have the internal cultural piece. I'm, I'm curious, and from a board standpoint, how easy or difficult it is to, to get that sort of spending on you know, cultural awareness and things like that. Is that part of the, the value vector that you, I mean, you have a limited budget. Uh, even though it's the most important thing in, 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 your, in IT, uh, you can't spend it all on technology, you can't spend it all on people, you can't spend it all on 
uh, internal you know, cultural awareness. Right. How do you divvy the pie? So I'll tell you, I'm glad you asked that question because one thing I report to the board is how I spend the budget. And, and there's a pie chart that shows that about 59% gets spent on technology solutions, 33% is spent on, on staff, whether it's uh, employees or contractors, another 5% on professional services, another 3% on managed services. But they can see how, I, what, what are the resources I use to protect the organization, but you touched on something that's very important to us, and it's having a culture of security. And that's where all those things come into play. Category is training and awareness for the employees. So we transformed our security awareness program two years ago into a security awareness education and training program. Because now there are different aspects to it. So based on human behavior, we now can pinpoint where a, a, a specific employee may need to be developed so that they have a better culture of security, so that we have security embedded throughout our organization and it's not just a one-time training content that they take or a one-time phishing test. It's a continuous process and we do it more as a development approach as opposed to having some type of punitive thing attached to it, so. Will AI change the mix in that pie chart over time? I, I don't think it will very much because we, we are, I think, very efficiently staffed, if you will. Uh, you know, we're, we're a, a billion dollar company uh, with a little over a thousand employees, but we, we, we leverage managed services to do that. And I think uh, AI will assist the managed services that we use to become more efficient because I look at it in terms of what's the FTE equivalent that I get out of that managed service and how much money is it saving me? And they'll look at it as if they deploy AI, they can further reduce their cost to provide me the service that I need, so. So you said internal staff was, I recall, about a third, right? right? And then you got managed services, so if you add those two up, it's, it's still lower than industry averages. I mean, I would think it's more closer to two thirds well, for most companies. I, I like to think we are very good at strategic <laughs> planning. Seriously, I mean, that's, that's pretty good. So, but I, I would think for companies that are in the two thirds or even six, you know, 65, 70% even, that AI may help attack that problem, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I agree, because you know, certainly we, we can't discount the, the attackers are using AI yeah. to, to create their attacks, so we certainly have to use it whether it's in, and we're going to use it during our business, you know, to optimize processes or to improve customer service and all these things, right? But we also have to utilize it in cybersecurity to be able to protect ourselves against the attacks. To, to you know, machine learning is going to help us learn how those attacks are morphing and changing. And you know, it's, it's all the same tactics and techniques, but they're, they're morphing into different ways to carry them out. John, a pleasure having you on. You're now a Cube alum. So uh, welcome, awesome. welcome great to the crew. Yeah, thank great you. conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. I greatly appreciate you all and, um, and enjoy the experience. Thank you. I'm Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante. Keep it right here on theCUBE. We'll be back with more from Falcon 2024. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in technology enterprise coverage and analysis.